Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. Back in History Hack Hedgehopping Days, which was the podcast I did before starting the Damcasters, we did an episode about what really happened with the 9th Troop Carrier Command on D-Day. So if you were to read the likes of Cornelius Ryan, more recently, you can break out James Holland, and of course, Stephen Ambrose in Band of Brothers. All of those tales will look at the dropping of the 82nd Airborne and the 101st Airborne from the perspective of the paratroopers who ended up not where they were supposed to be. So in that episode, we welcomed two great guests. We had Flight Lieutenant Seb Davey, the bomber leader for the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, and 9th Troop Carrier Command historian Adam Berry, who's a mace of mine and a bit of a rock star, as you're going to find out today and if you go back and watch that episode too. So we looked at the realities of what it takes to fly a C-47. That's where Seb came in. He flies one for the BBMF. It doesn't fly like you'd think. Now, load that up overload it even with paratroopers equipment fly it at night in tight formation and then hit a fog bank just before the drop zones come racing up on you it was an interesting pod go back to listen to that if you want a bit more context because what we're going to do today is talk about what the ninth tcc did next with adam and they did a lot. They were incredibly busy from the off, from the 7th of June straight through to the end of the war. Now, we're going to be talking about Operations Freeport in Memphis, which is the resupply of the two airborne divisions. We're going to be talking about medical evacuation flights. We're going to be talking about Operation Dragoon. And we will be talking about the resupply to Bastogne, which is a great story in and of itself. We will not be covering Operation Market Garden because... Everybody else has covered that a lot. And we're going to be saving Operation Varsity, which is the airborne part of Operation Plunder, which was the crossing of Rhine in 1945 for its own episode. So we're going to kick this one off by looking back and quickly recapping that episode with Seb. And then Adam's going to take it away. We start delving into what the 9th Troop Carrier Command did next. Very enjoyably had an evening with the lovely Seb Davey from the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight a little while ago, and we talked about the realities of the 9th Troop Carrier Command on D-Day. So if you want all the background, how to fly a Dakota, links in the description below, dear listener, because that's, I think it was about an hour and a half of us just rabbiting on about C-47s on D-Day. But for if you're coming to this one new and you're not going to disappear off for a bit to listen to that podcast, who were the 9th Troop Carrier Command, Adam? And sort of as a positive history, as we're going to get into, yes, they supplied the airplanes the jumpy boys jumped out of, but who were they? What were they set up to do? Okay, so um, officially 9th Troop Carrier Command were a what the Americans called a tactical air support unit of the 9th Air Force, which is where they got their, uh, you know, their 9th designation from. Um, as the name suggests, their primary purpose was to provide aircraft for paratroopers to jump from and for gliders to be towed with to a combat mission, essentially. The troop carrier groups differed from a transport group uh, in that... Um, they had a doctrine which was which had four or five points in it, but number one was always that their primary role was delivering airborne troops to combat in World War Two, and they had to be ready to do that at any point. They had to be willing to drop what they were doing at any point in order to um, deliver airborne forces to to combat. Um, so Nine Troop Carrier Command was was based in the UK from um, February until, uh, sorry, February 1944 until uh, around about the same time, 45. Um, it consisted of three wings, the 50th, the 52nd and the 53rd. And those three wings, between the three of them, contained 14 troop carrier groups, each of which had four squadrons. So the groups would consist roughly of about 18 aircraft each, 18 aircraft each, 100 aircraft each, <laughs> excuse me but on a combat operation 
a squadron would normally furnish at least 18 aircraft each. So a serial would be 36 aircraft and a, a group would fly 72 aircraft on a combat operation, roughly. It did increase ever so slightly as the war went on, but um, in a nutshell... So was, was, was that to ensure any... Any late technical issues, they had aircraft that they could slot straight in, th- things like that, aircraft that were on, on checks. There yeah, was always I mean, the space to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like any any unit that flies their aircraft over a combat zone where there's uh, nasty people shooting up at them, um, aircraft were inevitably grounded with uh, battle damage, technical malfunctions, you name it, so that there was always air, spare aircraft on charge. And, um, and a bit like, again, as you would find any you know research in bomb groups, very it wasn't always the case that the same crew would fly the same aircraft every mission you know they they flew what was available to them at the time so hmm. so like we said before the the his, the hedge hopping history hack hedge hopping one that we did we went into a lot of detail about the nature of flying the aircraft the the, the difficulties on d-day itself so what yeah. we're going to do in, in this one is talk about what happened next isn't it so yeah we've got a lot to cover we're going to say early on dear listener we're skipping market garden arnhem mainly because that's sort of done to death elsewhere and we're going to save varsity which was the crossing of the rhine the airborne element of operation plunder for its own pod because there's too much to get into with that because there is a whole mess of things going on in early 1945 that probably needs its own time and we've got enough to get through now so yeah. the ninth does the famous drop and if you've listened to the previous part i'm pugling out as well because we had a lot of fun doing that one um <laughs> it wasn't like cornelius ryan stephen ambrose and everybody said it there were specific reasons why the drop happened as it did but they get back and the turnaround is pretty quick. What happens next? Because in a lot of popular expressions, and I've heard people say this, that the transports don't really do anything until they start doing medevacs three weeks later. That's not true, is it? They are busy the whole time. Yeah, I mean, the, f- the first thing to, to point out is that once the power drops had taken place on, on the in the early morning hours of, of June 6th, Almost immediately, um, the command starts bringing gliders in. So there's there's actually five five uh, missions into Normandy on D Day itself on the sixth of June, pulling gliders in, and the first one reaches the DZ just after four a.m. in the morning. So it's still dark. Um, there's still an awful lot of um, activity in the air, activity on the ground, um, and then the four other four other flights they land in Normandy um, in the in the evening of June sixth. Um, so from the moment the day turns June 6th until the moment it turns June 7, there are aircraft of nine troop carrier command in the air almost constantly, whether they're dropping paratroopers or they're bringing in gliders. You've also got the four glider missions that were carried out on the 7th of June to bring in um, the 325th Glider Infantry Regiment, which was one of the, uh, the main regiments of the 82nd Airborne Division, um, who were brought in over the course of uh, two missions in four flights. Um, so landing uh, in the early morning hours of June, well, I would I would probably call them early morning hours, but most people in the army wouldn't. But from 0700 onwards on the 7th of June, there was um, more gliders coming in um, to to continue the flights, bringing the, um, the, the 82nd into, into Normandy. So yeah, for the first, first 24 hours, and then for the first, um, you know, two or three hours on the morning of the 7th of June, things are very busy for 9 Troop Carrier Command. Um, and it doesn't really end there because, um, I'm sure we'll go into, they they carry out two aerial resupply missions, um, one called Freeport and one called Memphis, um, to resupply the 101st and to resupply the 82nd Airborne Division on, on the 7th of June. The plan clearly is do the drop, get the gliders in. But given what has happened with the the misdrops that, and everybody coalescing as best they can, was Freeport and Memphis... So Freeport was the 82nd resupply and Memphis was the 101st, right? Correct, yeah. Yeah. So were those missions planned or were they spun up as a result of what had happened? No, they were, they were always planned. Um, as with everything, 
they didn't go to plan, <laughs> um, but they they were all they, they were missions that were predefined before before D Day was launched. Yes, they were always going to happen. Okay, so you're an eighty second guy. I am ha- having written extensively on it, and more more of to come. We'll get back to that later. So let's look up from the ground first. What's the eighty second situation when Freeport is launched to resupply them on the seventh? So the 82nd situation on the ground is it's okay, it's good, it's not ideal, but it's good. Um, the plan for Freeport was always that um, that the resupply mission was going to carry the supplies over the Murderay River to the western side of the Murderay River. For those who are familiar with Normandy, Murder, the Murderay runs almost north to south. Um, and um, two regiments of the 82nd were dropped on the west side, so essentially they were cut off from the Utah beach side of the river, if that makes sense. So the idea was to drop the supplies to them because they were the ones that were more likely to need them um, because the supply trains coming in from Utah beach would be a little bit longer in getting uh, getting to them and relieving them. As it happened, it didn't really turn out that way. The official records indicate that the the drop for the 82nd took place northeast of St. Mary Glees, but again, anyone with a, with a Sort of fairly decent knowledge of of, uh, of Normandy and the operations, particularly in the eighty second area, will know that much of that area was in at that point um, by the seventh of June was in friendly hands, and uh, by that point as well, also the fourth infantry division had hooked up with the eighty second in Saint Mary Glees, and therefore there was a supply chain, albeit a, a fairly um, modest improvised supply chain, but the supplies were coming inland from Utah Beach by that point. The actual drop um, appears to have taken place in the the, the the area between the two murder ray crossings. So one at Lafayette, which is a, obviously a very popular um, tourist attraction. It's where the Iron Mike statue is, the bridge at Lafayette and the manor. Is, it's one of the hottest tourist spots in Normandy. Um, the slightly lesser known bridge now, at, at, the, at the time it wasn't a place you'd want a holiday <laughs> no no absolutely not no um even even on the 7th of june well particularly on the 7th of june things were um it, it, well it, at that point it was there was never, not really any certainty that the 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 82nd success in seizing the bridge and the causeway and actually using it to to push the bridgehead further west had succeeded the germans had done a pretty good job of keeping the paratroopers very well sort of entrenched around the bridge and the situation was um, precarious to say the least. The lesser known bridge further to the south, uh, just out, just on the western outskirts of Chef du Pont, was also a key crossing point for the Americans in that area to move west beyond the Murderay River. And um, it looks as though the supplies were dropped in the fields between those two two bridges to the east of the river to resupply the forces that were essentially were fighting at those bridges in order to ensure that um, any risk of those positions collapsing was um, was minimised. Um, unfortunately, um, as was the case on the 6th of June, the weather on the 7th of June was still pretty poor. Um, and the mission was flown in the darkness hours, much like the... Um, the air power drop was for the previous day and a, a significant cloud bank. We spoke a lot about cloud banks on the last pod. Goodness, um, the clouds, it's bringing back memories. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it forced a quite a quite a number of the aircraft that were flying a Freeport mission to basically abandon the mission. Um, so some of them didn't even um, sort of leave the UK. They... They hit a cloud bank and they uh, they basically put the aircraft down as low as they could could get it in order to see where they were. And then the first airfield they came across, they they dumped themselves down down at these airfields in order to obviously prevent aerial collisions or getting lost or for similar situations like what happened the night before happening again. Of those aircraft that did make it through. They found that actually the German flak was significantly worse than it was the previous night. So, on the on the night of the first mission, even though the one hundred first airborne division had preceded the eighty second by um, by quite some time, by j- just under an hour, 
the Germans were were preoccupied in in trying to figure out what was going on and to assess the airborne drops and were obviously still reeling from the surprise of uh, thousands of American paratroopers descending down on their heads. On the second day, the situation is settled down ever so slightly. So when the aircraft were flying overhead, German flak was ready for them. They were much more alert and um, and the ground forces that had anything capable of inflicting damage on a C-47, anything from a you know, an MG-42 um, on an anti-aircraft mount, um, was firing up at the aircraft. So we actually lost 11 aircraft shot down to enemy gunfire on the Freeport mission, which is it's it's less than it was the night before, but for the 52nd Troop Carrier Wing, which was the wing carrying out the mission, the Freeport mission, the losses were a lot higher than they were the night before. So the Freeport mission doesn't go as swimmingly as, as one might hope or have hoped. How did Memphis go? Me- Memphis was, was was better. They had a similar situation with aircraft having to turn around because of the weather, but they, they only lost, I say only, they lost three aircraft on the operation. So again, the 52nd wing, um, you know, it took quite a beating on the uh, on the night of the Freeport mission. The worst story actually to come out of Freeport was, as I say, the mission was launched in the darkness hours. So the aircraft were taxiing out um, from their hard stands at their various airfields in the darkness. And of course, a lot of the airfields at this time of the war were still were still in blackout conditions or, you know, as close to blackout conditions as they could, could be. And and taxiing at night was difficult, to say the least. Um, and two aircraft of the 316th Troop Carrier Group taxied into one another on the ground at RAF Cottesmore. It significantly damaged one of them but the other one had the entire nose section of the aircraft essentially chopped off by the propeller of the other one. And unfortunately, the pilot of the aircraft that was piloting the aircraft had its nose chopped off, had both his legs severed and didn't survive. So for the 316th, the report was not going well before the aircraft had even left the ground. And for those who have got Volume 1, of, uh, of mine and Hans's book, there are pictures of those aircraft on the ground at Cottesmore showing the, the the extent of the damage, and it just goes to demonstrate the difficulties that these men had flying aircraft that didn't really have all of the techn- technological gizmos that aircraft have these days in doing a simple task like taxiing it out to the runway, basically. And you have to remember, aircraft collide with everything on the ground now. It's it's not a completely unheard of thing but when you've got that many aircraft heavily laden full of fuel and you're already pretty knackered after what you've done before accidents will happen and that is that's pretty tragic yeah i mean the 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 guy that um that was killed with the 316th he he had flown the neptune mission the night before so he'd flown an aircraft that dropped paratroopers of the 82nd over normandy so um you know essentially uh, less than 24 hour turnaround for him um and you can see why mistakes like that get made because, okay, the mission time wasn't huge um, in terms of the, the hours that were in the air on the 6th of June. But when you factor in the stress levels and everything that comes with a combat mission, um, the weight on the shoulders of these men in terms of dropping, making sure that they do a good job in dropping, you know, the two American airborne divisions is pretty big. And obviously it's it's easy for us to sit back and say, you know, they're only in the air for six hours or whatever. But um, as you know, Boney, back in those days, these aircraft weren't fly-by-wire. They were difficult to fly. And as I say, with the added stress, you can see why these fairly short periods of their day would be extremely exhausting for them. And then, like I say, less than 24-hour turnaround, they're back in the air again to um, to go back over the same area they were over the night before. So, yeah, it's difficult. How much did they drop? I, I think I read it was about 100, 100 tonnes of surprise, uh, something like that, or am I catching you on the hop there? Because that's not. I, d- I did write it down. <laughs> <laughs> I did write it down. Um, yes. Uh, where did I? So I did. I write it down. Um, I can't remember if I did it. I will come back to you on that one. I wrote lots of. I I, I might have lost it because I, I've written an awful lot of <laughs> random numbers down of su- the number of supplies dropped and things well, like that. So. Let, let's not worry about that. Let's get on to <laughs> let's get on to the the general supply grind because yeah. that's what starts kicking in next. It's regular flights over the beachhead, getting supplies in. Um, 
Yeah. As they're building up the ALGs, as they're building up that sort of massive weight of force in it. So what's happening between Freeport and Memphis through to the establishment of the advanced landing grounds, which allowed them to actually land? Okay, well, they didn't actually they didn't actually fly any resupply missions until the ALG, ALGs were completed. Um, so there was no more parachute resupplying, if you want to call it that. They, but the C forty seven was capable of essentially landing on a on a on a field. Um, and there are instances of where aircraft have, have have brought in vital supplies by landing on the ALGs before they've been finished. But essentially, with, within a few days. Uh, the advanced landing grounds are in a position where the aircraft can start bringing supplies in. And of course, at this point, the Allies are still building the Mulberry Harbours. So um, what the C-47s are bringing in is absolutely critical in keeping the American effort in that area of the beachhead going. So it is the focus on the west side. Are, are they bringing supplies in or are they doing it for all three armies? No, Sorry, they're, they're, by saying American, British, and Canadian. <laughs> yeah, British, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, they're they're mainly doing it for for the American side. But one thing that 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 is worth pointing out at this point is that one of the one of the key things that that Nine Troop Carrier Command had to keep themselves prepared for is the fact that there were plans for them to actually drop the the British First Airborne Division into Normandy. Now, not many people are aware that this was ever part of the overall sort of encapsulated plan for Normandy. But prior to it all being launched, there was always a tentative plan for them to drop the 1st Airborne Division just outside of Caen. Um, and in actual fact, after D-Day had taken place and the Freeport mission was out of the way, a load of the high-ranking generals and those in the position of power in 9 Troop Carrier Command and in the 1st Airborne Division met up in order to finalise these plans. But there was considerations taken over the the position of German forces in where the drop zones would would originally have been. And of course, the fact that um, the fighting was so so intense around there and so fluid and changed so often that um, it was considered too dangerous a mission to carry out. So 9 Troop Carrier Command were, for want of better terminology, you know, on standby to carry out this mission. Um, and whilst that was the case, they weren't really, you know, con- putting too much consideration into the resupply flights because delivering the 1st Airborne Division was, was at the time the bigger, the greater priority. In hindsight, we can look back now and say not doing that was probably a good it was probably a good move because the they, nine troop carrier command probably would have lost an awful lot of aircraft on a mission like that, dropping troops in that area. Um, but so the first would have been ripped to pieces as well. Cause that very likely. Yes. Yeah. And then of course you've got ramifications knocking. <laughs> Does market <laughs> garden happen if we, if it wanted, if the first airborne division had dropped into Normandy, things like that, you know, it's, um, you know, so it's these little decisions that, that can change the, the way the whole war goes really. But, um, yeah, so they're really thinking at the time about the, the pending delivery of 1st Airborne Division, which is something that um, I think anyone that had done the, the June 6th missions into Normandy would have been thinking, yeah, I'm not sure I fancy this one. It's one of those things because it's, they keep looking at what they can do with the 1st, isn't it? There's, I think, is it four or four or six operations that are spun up to yeah. try to, to aid the breakout that I guess that keeps, as we're going to go on to talk about with, medical evacuation and the supply flights that's keeping an element of that always with one hand tied behind the back because they're trying to find a way to use to use the first aren't they and it's yeah i guess yeah, that's, as, that's an interesting consideration for you when you're looking at it as well yeah and as, as i say um you know going back to what i said at the start of the pod with the doctrine that the troop carrier groups had that their primary role was delivering airborne forces mm-hmm. So that you know that there, there, there would have always been that overhanging um, risk isn't the right word, but chance that they're they're all of a sudden going to be pulled off whatever it is they're doing to go and drop drop an airborne division, and of course they'd have done whatever they were they were tasked to do. But um, in in this instance, I think not doing it was certainly the right choice. Because it just needs to be said, as we talked about in the in the other pod. Go listen to that, dear listener. Um, they had done a lot of training with the airborne troops as well. So their primary focus was actually dropping it. It wasn't these guys piling in the back and then figuring out how to do it on the day. Was it? 
No, yeah, the, the the Americans actually really, really, really enjoyed training with the British. Um, at, the, at the earlier stages of training in the UK, around sort of the March April time, the Americans were of the opinion that that close liaison with the British airborne divisions was much better than it was with the Americans. Um, and and if you actually look at the troop carrier command records, the success rates on airborne exercise with the British is significantly higher. Um, and what, you know whether or not that's you know it's down to the fact that I think we'd been at it for a little bit longer when it came to using airborne forces. Um, I don't know, but um, but yeah, we'll leave that for another another <laughs> another show. But Woody can worry about that on World War Two TV. Yeah. One of the things that always strikes me when, especially looking at, at Normandy, the operations from the advanced landing grounds, which is where most of my head gets to with with the Normandy battles with typhoons as soon as they could come over in late June or early June until they started getting shelled and they had to pull them out again and the dust, another podcast, is the medical evacuation flights because yeah. – there are some amazing imagery of how they reconfigure the C-47s. They have flying nurses on board. So you have women in what are still forward areas performing life-saving work. And also it means you're getting guys back to proper medical facilities within hours as opposed to days. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we did a big a big section in Volume 1 about the, the, the medical air evacuation squadrons, as they were known, um, because they're they're always referred to as being a unit attached to a, to a troop carrier group or to a troop carrier wing. But I actually think that these that, that, that these guys and, and girls should have been very much considered to have been part of a troop carrier group. Um, because the mission that they, the, the job that they did was so incredibly vital, so incredibly important um, to um, the survival of so many uh, wounded soldiers. Because, of course, Anyone that suffered from a, a, a particular type of injury or anyone that had got an injury that was severe enough that they needed a particular type of care very urgently, um, you know, these aircraft became extremely vital um, and, and extremely vital to them. I've actually got some some numbers um, in terms of the number of, of wounded oh, soldiers. You, you, you wrote these ones down, did you? I did write these ones down, yeah, yeah. Um, because it's... Um, I actually find it. I actually find the numbers that they flew out quite mind blowing, to be honest with you. So, in June alone, they they, they fly fifteen thousand wounded soldiers out of out of Normandy. Sorry, um, fifteen fifteen thousand. Yeah. yeah. So, um, one of the things that that's, that I'm always keen to point out the the, the nine troop carrier command diaries always like to mention it, but it also makes perfect sense is that they never they they tried never to fly C forty seven anywhere empty, mm. because why would you? Yeah. Um, so they would fly supplies out to an ALG, and it would park. They'd park at a certain area of an ALG and get all these supplies dumped out, and then they'd taxi to another area of it where they would they'd pick up wounded personnel. And this is where the nurses really come into it because, and I always refer back to uh, for anyone that's familiar with Band of Brothers, and the whole Bastogne scene and the and and Doc Rowe in the seminary with the French nurse, and there's a line in Band of Brothers where he. He looks at her and he says, your touch calms people. And it's funny because the, the Nine Troop Carrier Command diary uses words very similar to that, that the nurses had a calming effect on men when they were treating them on board these aircraft. They had ways of calming their emotions, settling them down, almost alleviating some of the effects that come naturally with shock just by being there, just by touching these men, basically. Um and I, I genuinely don't think that the importance of that can be overstated. The other thing as well is that, as with a lot of medical facilities that were established in Normandy um, at the time, they weren't just catering for the care of Allied soldiers. They were taking Germans back to the UK for treatment or any, you know, any other Axis um, force or Axis soldier that was wounded back to... Uh, back to the UK for treatment. Now, when you think about the fact that in some cases they were picking these men up from airfields that were five or six miles back from the front lines, imagine the tension that would have been on board the aircraft, you know, soldiers of both nationalities been on board. But these nurses just had a knack of just completely um, disarming the situation and calming it all down. And um, 
there was a, a I can't remember the quote exactly. There was a German, a German who had been struck by artillery, and the artillery, the blast on him was so vicious that it ripped everything off him, and I mean everything, bar one boot. And he was loaded on board this aircraft, um, in that state basically. He was on a stretcher under a blanket, but the nurse tried to take this one boot from him, and the German didn't want this boot taken from him because it was the one piece he'd got left of, you know, everything that he had, basically. Um, and the story the story is that this this nurse sympathised with this German and um, um, that she'd, she helped this German feel welcome on board the aircraft and that she, she calmed the Americans that were around him down. And, you know, this German basically attributes this nurse to, you know, saving his life, basically. Um and I think you know I, th- I think stories like that are great because it you know it's there's sides of war that you don't really you know you don't too often get to read about because you know war is war a lot of a lot of what we read about is about people getting killed unfortunately and um it's nice to see the other side of it on the odd occasion but yeah I mean their their, their job to go into five minutes of de- five minutes of detail on it was their job was to meet with ground based medics when the aircraft was on the ground and they would assess how many men they could get on board the aircraft basically the the aircraft was capable of 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 having stretches on racks that hang that hung down from fuselage six on either side of the fuselage so they could have 12 stretch of patients uh, on board the aircraft but they could also get anybody that was capable of, of sitting or even standing on board the aircraft but these nurses also had to have a decent knowledge of what the aircraft's gross takeoff capacity was. Obviously, they would work with the air crew, but they would have to know that, you know, they, they couldn't, for example, have more than 20 guys on board the aircraft, but they could. They would squeeze on as many as they could. And then it was their job to make sure that these guys were looked after whilst they were on board the plane. And then the aircraft would fly to the UK, and invariably they would fly to an airfield that was close to a, a, a general hospital somewhere in England, and as far as the air crew and the flight nurses are concerned, off off they would go. But yeah, they were they were very special women, very important women to to keeping a, an awful lot of guys alive at that stage of the war. Utter angels, really. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I another just to bring another number in. Um, so obviously, I mentioned that they flew fifteen thousand out in in June. The busiest month for them was actually August forty four. They flew twenty three thousand out in the month of August. Yeah. But between um, between June forty four and December forty four, nine troop carrier command flew one hundred twenty five thousand wounded personnel out of the um, out of the ALGs in in Europe back to the UK. So it, it's a huge number um, of men, and you have to think that a, a a decent percentage of those men would have died without it. Um, cl- clearly, yeah, as the med- you read about the medical facilities being spun up on the continent, they're they get a lot better, but from your numbers there, just in those few months, I guess with the advance as well, it's moving those things forward. Yeah, most people will think of mass units, but those things don't shift easy. And what they then had five years later was not what they had at the time of the Second mm-hmm. World War. So, evacuating back to the UK, where hospitals were ready and waiting, and and had had been preparing for years for this sort of thing, yeah, um, was was very very something. I I, I find those those accounts of, of the DVAC flights really, really something. Cause it's in all of them, you just read there's, there's a, I don't want to say passion, but there's a determination of the crews and the nurses to do the job. Yeah. You know, that it's not just flying stuff. It's, you know, this, that, that flight almost sort of meant a l- more to them than it did some of the other stuff, mm. maybe from a drop perspective aside. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the, the one thing as well, that's worth pointing out is that for nine troop carry command, this was, every day um you know it was every day uh, so it was they were yeah they were doing their bit we're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the pima air and space museum with head of collections andrew Bowley. here we are at the pima air and space museum with some of our korean war vintage aircraft um here is our f-86 e saber um which was the preeminent american jet fighter during the Korean conflict. Um, originally, we were flying a lot of straight wing aircraft like the F-84 and you know, reciprocating engine aircraft still like the Mustang, various other aircraft. Um, when this aircraft made its debut, 
the MiG-15, which was used by the North Koreans, um, with also probably some help from other nations. Um, but it was a game changer, swept wings, had a cannon, and really you know, overpowered anything with a straight wing. Um, around that time, our F-86 started coming into Korea, which the two aircraft were pretty equally matched. Uh, armament aside, you know, the uh, F-86 had 50 calibers, while the MiG had, I believe, 20 millimeter cannons, if I recall correctly, three. Um, so 30 millimeter, I think it was. 30, was it 30 millimeter? Two, two, 230, 220, something, something like that, yeah. Okay. Cannon. Not the armaments. It, they're cannons, yeah, machine cannons. guns, which yeah. has always been a big argument. You know, the <laughs> Americans were always full in on the 50 cal and the machine gun side of things, while a lot of other nations tended to lean towards cannons. You know, so depends who you ask, which is the better air, aerial weapon. But our F-86 is actually a real combat veteran. We would the 51st fighter interceptor wing. Um, it's a bit of a Franken airplane. The fuselage did come from the a Korean War veteran. The wings did come from another aircraft, but that was one of those things where we decided to go with obviously the identity of the fuselage, which you know has the more interesting history and has an actual Korean War combat provenance. Um, it could be a little bit of a time too to talk about our territorial choices with paint schemes. Yes. Usually we always try to paint our aircraft in markings that are historically accurate for that aircraft. This F-86 is an example of this. The markings on the aircraft are based on photographic evidence from the Korean War of this aircraft. Our MiG-15, on the other hand, like most surviving MiGs in a lot of collections, is a Polish MiG. It's not a Korean MiG. But because for this, we decided we wanted to tell the story of the Korean War, so we did paint this aircraft in North Korean markings, where usually we don't do that. Um, we usually always try to paint the aircraft for, uh, you know, the historically accurate markings for that aircraft. But like I said, once in a while when we have another story to tell, we'll uh, make an assumption. Also, if we painted all our MiGs, they would all be pretty much in Polish markings instead of uh, representing some of the different um, Warsaw Pact nations like we have. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. So you, you said about the numbers getting up to August, you said 20 odd thousand in August, but... yeah. They have a bit of a distraction in August, don't they? Because some of them have <laughs> yes, to do, head, yeah. head, head to the south of France, and that's not, not for holidays. What percentage of, of the units in the UK get retasked with heading down to support Operation De Groom, which is dropping the, the first airborne task force, which is that sort of amalgamation of, of, of different units that they, they dropped into the south of France? Yeah, so eight of the groups that were made of the command of, of the 14 end up flying to, uh, to Italy for Operation Dragoon. Um, so I don't know what that is percentage-wise, 55, 60%, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a mathematician. Um, but um, yeah, so... Lots. Lots, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's eight groups. It's a total of 413 aircraft of the command fly off to um, to southern Italy. And and what's interesting about it is that although Dragoon's obviously not, it doesn't take place until mid-August, they actually fly out there in the middle of July. So nine troop carrier command loses... Um, more than 50% of its uh, its charge of aircraft for Dragoon for over a month. Um, and aside from, from the aircraft that they lose, they lose their commanding officer because uh, Major General Paul Williams, who was the commanding officer of 9 Troop Carrier Command, he goes out to Italy because he wants to personally oversee the planning and the training and the, uh, the execution of Dragoon. Um, and the 52nd Troop Carrier Wing lose their XO, a guy called uh, Colonel Dick Petty, who was um, second in command of the 52nd Wing, who, although the 52nd Wing actually didn't take part in Dragoon, he goes out there to to act as the Chief of Staff and, and does an awful lot of planning and actually flies the operation himself as well. So, um, so yeah, they lose a decent, a decent number of aircraft for a significant amount of time. Which makes those numbers in August being medevaced out even more remarkable when you're thinking it's a subset of the whole group. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, sorry, I, I, of the whole command, there's multiple groups. <laughs> yeah. The, the, I, the, the way that USAF set things up, just, oh, I, it's, not, yeah, it, it's not easy to remember 
all the different areas. No, no, no. It's, it's, no, it's, it's, it's funny. When you, when you talk of squadrons from a US Air Force point of view, it's very different to mm. RAF. And yeah, it, it can be very confusing. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. They, um, for them to have flown 23,000 wounded personnel out of, um, you know, out of France in, in August 44, um, given the, the, the significant reduction of aircraft and manpower that they have available to them is, is very impressive. Um, and I'm sure for those that were state that remained back in the UK, which was it was a 52nd troop carrier wing, in its entirety, so five groups of the 52nd wing, and then one group of the 53rd troop carrier wing remained in the UK. Um, they would have been very busy. That's the thing to remember, dear listener. That whereas in the RAF it goes group wing squadron, in the US Air Force it goes wing group squadron. Uh, yeah, just yeah. do it all the same. Come well, on. It's, it's, it's it's similar with the airborne divisions in the way that you know we had re- uh, the Americans had regiments and and battalions and the, we had uh, brigades and battalions and yeah yeah different terminology different ways of um, it can be yeah. very confusing. Oh, yeah, let's not get into that now. But let, let's talk about <laughs> Dra- Dragoon. Dragoon yeah. is interesting because it's to my reading anyways for the most part it's completely overshadowed by what's going on in in the north and yet it's it's not easy you've got difficult terrain you have the you know the axis of events which cuts almost straight towards the mountains doesn't it as they, as they just try to swing around yep. um in, into northern italy as well what happens for the drop of the the first atf as well because there's been i'm thinking of um Kershaw's book, um, was it the Liberators, uh, that talks about the... the oh, 45th? 45th, yeah. yeah. So they've gotten a little bit of what's going on at the ground. But what happens with the airborne element of, of Dragoon? Where where are they being dropped? Are they getting somewhere nice, like Toulon or, 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 or Marseille, <laughs> or are they, they getting dropped somewhere a bit more nasty? No, they're getting dropped in nice areas. They're getting dropped in all the vineyards and um, and all of the, the, the nice lush valleys. Um <laughs> Actually, Dragoon is probably the most successful airborne operation of the Second World War. From the standpoint of the success of the drops themselves, and also from the standpoint of, of, of the aircraft that are involved. So what what's interesting about, about Dragoon is that a a unit called the the PTC A D is established. And it stands for the Provisional Provisional Troop Carrier Air Division is established. And the reason why they do this is because the entirety I'm of... I'm sure they were on a bonus for acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I find that with a lot of researching with a lot of American stuff, they, they'll take any opportunity to create a new unit that they can, they're given, basically. <laughs> uh, and this was clearly one. Um, so the, the 50th Troop Carrier Wing, which was part of 9 Troop Carrier Command and Station in the UK, they go over, all four groups of that wing go over. Four of the five wing groups of the 53rd Troop Carrier Wing go, go over. But then there are also two groups of the 51st Troop Carrier Wing, which are not part of 9 Troop Carrier Command, that fly the Dragoon mission. And these are the originals. These were the guys that dropped what became the 509th Parachute Infantry Battalion in North Africa in November 1942. They were the trailblazers. Um, and these guys have pretty much always been stationed in the, in the Mediterranean theatre, which up until later on in the war, they they, they spend most of their time there. Um, so they were, they were clearly always going to be involved in Dragoon. So when when all of these aircraft are out there and all of these various groups are out there, the, the, the Provisional Troop Carrier Air Division is what they all came under. Um, I've not done a lot of research into the 51st Troop Carrier Wing. Um, some friends of mine, Mark Valos, he's done he's done a book about one of the groups. So if anyone wants to read up about them, there are books out there. But from a 9 Troop Carrier Command standpoint, so the groups that flew from England for the operation, Dragoon was incredibly successful. Um, probably the worst of the drops was that there were a couple of aircraft that dropped one unit five miles from their drop zone which for a paratrooper is a 20-minute hike, really, um, whilst also picking grapes off vineyards and on whatever bottles you find. And, and realistically, that's hitting the green light, uh, doing the math. Probably. It's, it's, it's minute 
it, it, it's not not long, is it? It's, it's, no, it, to, to be five to, to be five miles off your drop zone, you could probably be a minute to ninety seconds past the mm. drop zone, basically something like that. Yeah, it's it's very very minimal, and 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 realistically, um, it, it it could have been caused by the fact that on the morning of the of the operation there was a little bit of ground haze. You know, something as simple as that could have could have thrown this this uh, group off off course. But they lose one aircraft on the entire operation, wow. and it actually crashes on takeoff. So it's not it, it's it's not even shot down by the enemy. So you know, there are some groups that don't they don't report having experienced any flak at all flying into or out of the drop zones. So it it, it is what I guess you could define, or some would define, as a milk run for for nine troop carrier command. Um. They do also, of course, also assign somewhere in the region of 750 glider pilots to the operation because a number of the units, are around about 40% of First Airborne Task Force is glider-borne. So there's an awful lot of gliders involved in the operation as well, which is surprising um, that so many gliders were allocated to the operation considering the number that were used in Normandy and the number that would later go on to be used in Market Garden and obviously the logistical, opera- but, sorry, the logistical difficulties they have in in supplying the right number of gliders for these various operations. Um, but, but they do. Yeah. It, it's because you're thinking that's probably a month before getting gliders on boats, getting them down to North Africa. Yeah. And then of course the, the glider pilots are incredibly rare beast in the great scheme of things as well, aren't they? So yeah, be some, I mean, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean the, 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 the glider pilots, not only, as you say, were, were they rare, the casualty rates amongst them were, were, a lot higher as well so you you would lose more glider pilots every operation that was carried out whether it was successful or not because gliders tended to crash land whether they were whether they were landed properly or not you know because there were objects on the ground that they would strike and it, it sometimes it didn't matter how well the pilot put it down on the deck um they took a while to slow down particularly if they had heavy equipment on board um and the the area that the drop zones were as I say, they were in valleys. They were, they were relatively flat vineyard areas and things like that. You imagine owning a vineyard and having a you know a, a flight of Waco's just rip through the whole thing. But um, yeah, I, so I, they... I can hear my wife screaming. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, it's it, it's an operation that's it's it's it, it might not be Normandy and it might not be Market Garden in terms of costs, but it's it's still costly to nine troop carry command, and we do lose. I th- I think I read that they they lost. Somewhere in somewhere in the region of 24, 25 glider pilots. Not not all as fatalities, but but you know some were injured beyond being able to um, you know carry out another operation again. So, but you know they do ultimately have to replace these guys. So do, so what happens after? Do do they move into that same sort of flow that we would have seen in Normandy? That they're flying resupply? That they then as the airfields are being captured in the south of France, they're being able to medevac or because of the subject we're not going to talk about, are they then being rushed back north to the UK, getting ready for, for Arnhem? They're not rushed. They're not rushed back north, but they, they, they go back fairly quickly. Yeah. Um, Resupply missions for for Dragoon are are fairly minimal. There's certainly no pre-planned, you know, like Freeport or Memphis situations in terms of resupplies, Uh, anything beyond the first day anyway. Um, so eventually the, the groups make their way back to the UK and any, any resupplies that are needed in that area, um, they're handled by the 51st Troop Carrier Wing and the groups of that wing that are going to remain in that area. So like I said, we're going to skip Market Garden in its entirety. I think it's been covered covered to death. In, in these, I, it's, I, was, I was saying to Adam before we started that it, it's one of the ones I've, I'm going to try to avoid because I think it... <laughs> It gets covered a lot. Yeah, and and you, this this podcast would quite easily be three or four hours long if we started talking about market yeah. on. So it's Could, yeah, yeah. that's it. When when you sent over the list of what they got up to, I was like, right, well, <laughs> market gardens a couple hours at least. Yeah. Varsity's going to be a long one. Um, so let's let's talk about the other things because we get to get into what happens after market garden because market garden, as we know, doesn't go terribly well. Dear listeners, spoiler. Um, how does the ninth come out of it as they start to to regroup after that operation as they head into October, November time? What what's what's happening before the counterattack in in Ardennes? Because 
there's a lot of flux, there's a lot of movement, but then there's also a lot of suddenly solidifying. Because I know for the the tactical um, air forces, they're being rushed into that area at a great rate, and not so much so. Um, 440 squadron literally gets lost for two days because they have to land at a random airfield and they can't get fuel. So it's it's quite a fluid situation going on. How are the ninth fitting into this as they're getting getting ready? F- well, getting ready for the what they all consider the big push in the new year, but of course. Yeah, Germans have other ideas. <laughs> yes, they fall back very much into into post Normandy type stuff, resupply missions, um, and medical air evacuation flights. Um, November was a particularly busy month for them in terms of the medical air evacuation flights. We took nineteen thousand mm-hmm. out in in November, so um, that was clearly Did- quite a. Uh, which I, I presume would would coincide to when the Americans started that fruitless effort in the Hurgan Forest around that time, and you've got um, the Canadians in the shelter as well, and that, that's better, yeah. absolutely yeah. So, um, got, to, got, got to keep mentioning them, mate. You know how <laughs> well, this goes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, actually, one of the biggest issues that Nine Troop Carrier Command had at that point was uh, an issue of morale because. Um, Prior to Market Garden being launched, as you as you alluded to earlier, there were a number of airborne operations that the Allies were planning to attempt to sort of force units like the First Airborne Division into some some sort of action that ended up being cancelled because the DZs were overrun. And after Market Garden took place, there was rumours here and there that there would be other airborne operations, and then the rumours would would slowly disappear. Um, so all the way through the sort of um, very, very latter stages of September through to the end of November and midway into December when, as you say, Mr Hitler decides he's going to have one last go. Um, they think that their use as a, as troop carrier forces is done. And there's a number of the group's diaries re- refer to this issue that they have of morale with the men. They actually have an issue with discipline, which is um, marginally concerning. But eventually Eisenhower himself has to hand out this directive, which is basically that all of these troop carrier airfields have to start operating almost like Heathrow and properly start to look at who's jumping on board the aircraft when they go off to these resupply missions. Because what they were finding was that men were getting so bored that they were just deciding that they were going to go on furlough to Paris, for example, and they would jump on board these aircraft. But what they would do is they'd take two or three of their English girlfriends with them as well, off on holiday on these C-47s over to... uh, over to mainland Europe to um, see the sights. And um, Eisenhower decided that he needed to put a stop to that. So as weird as it sounds, for Nine Troop Carrier Command, the Battle of the Bulge comes at just about the right time for them because it it, it reignites them into this realisation that actually they do still have a purpose beyond heaving a load of crates of ammunition on board their aircraft and flying it over and then you know bringing wounded soldiers back. There's... That there's they are going to start working with the airborne divisions again in some way, shape, or form. So where are they based by this point? Have they moved across to the continent, or are they still operating from the UK? Some are operating from the continent. Um, some are operating still from the UK. It's probably about a sixty forty split in favour of of operating from the UK, which which turns out to be obviously of benefit, um, particularly with with what's to come. So obviously. Obviously, Hitler launches his, his counteroffensive in the Ardennes, and we see the story of the 101st Airborne Division being um, surrounded at Bastogne and the inclement weather and it grounding all of the airplanes. And we all know the story of, uh, of the first uh, sort of week or so of the Battle of the Bulge and how that went. 9 2 Carrier Command are made aware of the German offensive the day that it's launched. So on some of the war diaries, there's mention of particularly some of the higher ranking officers being taken into the briefing rooms or the war rooms, as they might have called them, and basically being made aware of the German counteroffensive. And essentially, it's their job to trickle that news down to all the men and make sure that they are ready for what might come. And they're given given fairly early indications of what that might be. And obviously, it doesn't take a genius to know that there's there's probably going to be some sort of resupply to the area because they they already, even in the very early stages, they know that there are units cut off from friendly forces. And that there's that there's also a mention of potentially air landing American units that are based in the UK in France, say that they can be 
um, sent to the front, basically. And in short, it, it all turns out to be what Nine Troop Carrier end up doing. And it's all encapsulated under an operation called Operation Repulse. Um, and whether or not that word is, is purposefully termed, given the context of a battle, I don't know. But the primary mission for them is to resupply the 101st Airborne Division. But obviously the weather makes that very difficult for them. So they're sat at the airfield waiting for the green light to go and take these supplies to the 101st. And the weather keeps telling them that it can't happen, it can't happen. And eventually it gets to the point, and it was similar actually to the situation with d- deploying the Polish paratroopers at, at Grave during Operation Market Garden, which we're not allowed to mention. But in that instance, the, the troop carrier pilots stood up and said, you know what, whether or not we have got to go and do this job, because otherwise things are going to go pear-shaped pretty quickly. So during the Battle of the Bulge, it's very much what happens. The American troop carrier forces know that in order to reach the 101st at Bastogne, where there might be good pockets of weather, they need to fly through some of the crappy stuff first. And that's that's what they do. So from the, from the 22nd to the 29th of December, the, the 9 Troop Carrier Command launch a number of major operations, Repulse being a combination of delivering aerial resupply missions to the 101st Airborne Division. Well, I'm loath actually to say the 101st. I'll say American forces at Bastogne because, of course, we know it wasn't just the 101st. But Band of Brothers says it's just them. Yeah, I, well, yeah. I, I didn't I didn't want to bring that up. Um, but let's say the American forces at Bastogne and also to the the 106th Infantry Division at, at, at Markeroy, um Markery. Excuse I, my lack of French um, accent on that. I do apologise for, but that one is, is one of those ones. So, so there's the two aerial resupply missions to Markeroy and Bastogne. But the biggest mission of all, actually, in terms of the sheer weight of it, is that they airland. And by airland, I mean up. We, we we we're not talking about a parachute deployment here. We're talking about taking off and landing with these personnel on board. They airland the entirety of the Seventeenth Airborne Division in France, who are based down near Tidworth Barracks in... um, Tidworth in Wiltshire? I think so. I should should know that. So that, in terms of sheer weight of of transportation and numbers and aircraft, is massive because, obviously, the 17th Airborne Division, they are an airborne division, but they've still got artillery pieces. They've got glider field artillery battalions. They've got parachute field artillery battalions. You know, 9 Troop Carrier Command's got to move all of their artillery pieces... Um, it's got to move every single man of the division over on board its aircraft to air land them in, in France. And it's a massive undertaking. I was going to look it up because the 17th arrive too late to be trained for Market Garden, don't they? So they're fresh yeah. to get dropped in um, in December. Isn't that right? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm scrambling because you're my go-to airborne guy and I usually ask you these questions. So I'm going to ask you. <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're not one of the more... I don't want to say famous, but they're, they're not one of the ones that have had a fancy book written about them, have they? No, um, they, they, they often get overlooked, yeah. But the, the 17th Airborne Division were as as good as they come in terms of airborne divisions. They were very well trained and an excellent commanding general. But yes, they were too late for, obviously too late for Normandy. They were too late for Market Garden. There were plans to, I think there are even considerations taken over whether or not they could be deployed by parachute during the Battle of the Bulge, but um, logistically, it just didn't seem like the right way to get them to combat for that particular um, engagement. Um, they, so They will reappear, dear listener, when we do our plunder varsity. Ab- absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 one, of, one of the things, obviously, that, again, is it's not too familiar to people, is that one of the regiments in the 17th Airborne Division did jump into Normandy. That was the 507th, because they were only really attached to the 82nd on a temporary basis. So in the end of August 1944, they're attached to the 17th Airborne Division. So when the 17th do enter combat during the Battle of the Bulge, the 507th do actually give them that slight combat edge, um, but they uh, otherwise are a green unit who perform pretty well in the first few days of their baptism by fire. There's... So much to talk about over the resupplies, in especially best best stone, best thing. Yeah, we'll call it best stone because that's the only I, I, I do actually have 
the number of su- the, the weight of supplies they Ooh. dropped to the one engine first. You see, so, after, after our earlier point, I'm a bit worried about asking them. Go, yeah. go for it, mate. What have you got? Yeah. Well, they they dropped 139 thousand pounds of equipment to the to the American forces that were surrounded at Bastogne during Repulse. So it's, it's decent. It's a, it's a decent amount of uh, of equipment, and of course this was all this was all deployed under parachute. None of it was air landed, um, but there was also glider missions. So a lot of it was landed by glider as well. But it was it was carried out in the truest sense of an, of an airborne resupply. What's what's interesting about it is that from a, from a one engine first airborne division perspective, this is the moment in the war where all of a sudden. The members of the 101st. If you read the likes of Don, Bar- Don Burgett's books, for example, it's the moment in in the war where the 101st go. You know what? These guys are actually quite brave, because in order to in order to reach the drop zones that had been identified by the 101st um, at Bastogne, first of all, they need to drop a Pathfinder team. So you've got aircraft that are flying Pathfinder teams of the 101st Airborne Division into the perimeter. Which is a dodgy job in its own right. Um, it's, it's, and it's lo- it's low and slow, isn't it? It's it's very yeah, very low and slow. And then um, the aircraft themselves flying the main serials, by very nature of the fact that the that the American forces at Bastogne are surrounded, they've got to fly over enemy forces in order to get there. And the enemy forces are going to know that oh, these aircraft have got resu- they've got supplies on board that. We really, really don't want these forces to have because we're having a hard enough time breaking the perimeter as it is. If they get all these supplies, the situation for us is looking a little bit, um, little bit worse for wear. Um, so the anti-aircraft fire is is massive on the American troop carrier aircraft that are flying in to deliver these supplies to to the to the Americans at Bastogne, and we lose nineteen aircraft on the operation. So that's worse than Normandy including the Freeport mission, for, for, for some of the wings anyway. It's not quite market garden numbers, but we again we're not talking about we're not talking about airborne operations over a number of days. So repulse is pretty it's pretty costly to nine troop carrier command. Because it's it's a concerted effort to drop a lot of supplies very quickly, isn't it? it to it, to, it, to show up the defence. Absolutely, yeah. So again, you know, books like by Don Burgett's talk about Watching the flight of VC forty sevens come over low and slow, seeing a number of them, you know, catch fire, engine fires, fires in the wings, things like that, and watching them go down, but seeing these aircraft maintain an immaculate formation, dropping the supplies exactly where they need them to go, and as I say, it's the first time that for some of the members of the one hundred first anyway, particularly those that are still probably reeling from the misdrops in, in Normandy way back when uh have gone actually these guys they do have a lot more bottle than we might have given them credit for because they wouldn't have seen the resupply attempts in and around arnhem where they took a battering as well this was really the first time they were actually watching as opposed to leaping out of these aircraft wasn't it yeah it was it's certainly the first opportunity where they really like you say did have chance just to stand in the snow covered fields and just watch these aircraft come overhead i mean even during market garden a huge proportion of the area resupplies, as you know, was carried out by the Second Air Division B twenty fours. You know, and and they better have seen the effect of, of of the flak on those aircraft then. But the resupply missions at Bastogne were really the first opportunity they had. And of course, we've got some amazing photos of it as well. You know, that have been in a million and one books over the years. But particularly, um, without meaning to uh, to plug it too much, um, Volume Two of Mine and Hands uh, book series on. Nine Troop Carrier Command has got some incredible colour photos of the aerial resupply at Bastogne, which is it's great from a, dare I say, a geek's perspective, because in a colour photo, you can see all the different coloured parachutes that denote the different types of bundles that they're dropping mm-hmm. from the aircraft, which is which is nice to see. Which wasn't in Band of Brothers, they were all nice white. No, that's it, yeah. Mm, yeah. See, yeah, if you've got your hopes up for masses of the air, people, remember it's in the details. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's get really geeky for a second, because over this period, retrofits are being done to the aircraft, self-sealing tanks are put in after Normandy? Yeah, uh, gradually, it, yes. Yeah, yeah, so because the C-47 is being worked on upgraded new ones are arriving because they're literally wearing wearing the old old ones out but then two other aircraft start coming in 
at this time as well, which we need to talk about because it's going to plug what we do for part two whenever we get around to doing that. That won't be right away because I need to do more reading on that one. Yeah. Um, which is, he says, sitting here in a consolidated aircraft T-shirt, the <laughs> C-109, which is the most weird B-24 ever, I think. Mm. It's, it's yeah. a flying bomb. Absolutely, yeah. And actually, they, they, it, it, it was... Uh, supposedly the B-24 was quite a difficult plane to fly anyway, but um, the C-109 made that even more so. In fact, they, the 9 Troop Carrier Command quite quickly learned to fly it without the nose tank and the tail tank. Um, which, which you just say, it, it was it was a, a tanker aircraft to fly in fuel for, for, for the ground. It, it's, it, it's, a, it's a flying gas can, essentially, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, for, for those who are not familiar, the C-109 was, was essentially a B-24 that had all its turrets taken out, um, you know, all anything that, that was in any way related to its job as a bomber taken out, and it was retrofitted with a load of these tanks inside that could be filled with what the Americans would call gasoline, what we would call fuel, uh, I guess. <laughs> um, petrol, you know, petrol, you say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, and it, it it massively increased the amount of, of of fuel, gasoline that the that the nine troop carrier command could fly. Um, over to over to the continent. So one C one hundred and nine could carry the equivalent of essentially what about ten or eleven C forty sevens could carry in jerry cans, basically. So um, nine troop carrier command start to take delivery of C one hundred and nines in in the December of nineteen forty four, and of course there's a there's a period of transition training for the crew because they're used to flying twin engine C forty sevens. And they've got very different flight characteristics, and um, so what troop what the troop carrier groups were finding were they were being uh, assigned bomber crews that had reached the end of their tours, and before they'd gone, they were sent home to the states. They were asked, or I, I would imagine, more told to go and sort of check in with these troop carrier groups and help them transition to four engine aircraft. Um, there was never a better demonstration of the reason why that was needed than a, an aerial collision that happened just just north of RAF Barkston Heath in Lincolnshire, where a, a C-109 and a B-24J that had not been converted to a tanker collided and, and killed everybody on board both aircraft. And, and the reason why that happened was because the two aircraft were flying in formation and... The pilot of the C-109 wasn't um, quite used to high bank turns in a four-engine aircraft, didn't know to apply more power, and the aircraft slipped down into the flight path of the other aircraft, and they collided. Which was and, very common on the B-24 with that Davis wing. It had a high slip in turns. Didn't it? Yeah. yeah. and to, to be very geeky about an airplane I haven't covered yet, and I need to. But Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's... It, yeah. It, it, so it, it demonstrated that it was a very difficult aircraft to fly and this transition training was extremely important um they also discovered as i say fairly early on that if you flew the aircraft with the nose so there was a tank in the nose where there would otherwise have been a bombardier in a turret and a tank in the tail where obviously you'd have had a tail gunner b20 yeah yeah uh, mine black mine mine went blank there i was thinking did the b24 have a tail on it turret yes it did um a powered one didn't it yes it did mm. yeah when they were full the aircraft was almost impossible to fly apparently which begs the question, why did they put them there? <laughs> did anybody think to test flying with the aircraft whilst it was full? But anyway, so it, they, it, they... Was, it was clearly numbers. For the, I'm, I'm going to be very cynical here. It was numbers for a contract. Was it? Oh, we can, we can, we can retrofit these aircraft, and you can get. I'd imagine so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, That's how it usually works out. Yeah. So it's, as Boney says, it's a bit of a weird looking aircraft because it it, it looks like a B twenty four, but that somebody has, has, has scribbled out the turrets and all of the cool looking bits and just patched them up. Um, uh, but they, but they, they served the purpose and they did, and they did a, a, a fairly decent job. And when the groups were assigned the C-109s, they triple the amount of gasoline they're flying to the front lines. So it, they, they kind of speak for themselves, really. The other aircraft is the C-46, Curtis Commando, <laughs> yeah. which... I, sp I suppose we need to mention because it's done good service over the hump. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and 
where the key point is nobody's shooting at it. It comes to Europe, and again, it's an aircraft that is a step change on from the C forty seven, much higher payload. Yeah, faster. It was faster on yeah. one engine than the yeah. C-47 was, yeah. Which, yeah. to be fair, was a rare thing because it usually burst into flames by the time. <laughs> yeah. it, um, yeah. it's, it, it was a hoped-for thing. So I, it comes up a lot when we do our varsity thing. It had a, a huge, I don't say impact, but there's... Put it like this. If you're ever watching a Market Garden... I'm stealing your, your line here. Yeah. Market Garden documentary, and you see a air quotes for the listener dakota going down in flames that's not market garden that's a c46 during varsity because it's yeah it, uh, yeah and, it's and literally a baptism of fire isn't it 100 percent on paper the c46 is a great aircraft mm. because it's it's got modern engines on it that are significantly more powerful than the ones that power the c47 it can fly faster than a c47 on one engine it was actually designed to be a four-engine aircraft, but the advancement in engine design and the power output that they could provide meant that it wasn't necessary. So it had a bigger wingspan than a B-17, which gives the listener an idea of just how big this thing was. It was unique in terms of it had what they called twin jump doors. In So you could have, instead of having one row of paratroopers down the centre of a cabin that jumped out of one door like you had with a C-47, you would have two rows of paratroopers that were jumping out of either side of the aircraft, which meant that you could carry twice the number of paratroopers on board an aircraft. And what this gives you is it gives a troop carrier group the ability to deploy an entire regiment as opposed to just two battalions of airborne infantry as they were sized back uh, towards the end of World War II. Um, so if you're an operational planner and the opportunity to utilise C-46 comes up, you're looking at it on paper going, wow, this thing looks amazing. Mm. But then Varsity happens. <laughs> and they realise it's not quite so good, uh, not quite as good as they thought it might be. It, uh, I, I do want to say this, but it, it's like none of the lessons learned work its way through to the aircraft. You know, it, the wings, the, the C-47 had vented wings, which basically we mean if it gets hit, it will expel fuel out. Yeah. Um, not terribly well, but it does, whereas the C-46 was an unvented wing, which basically meant it pooled in the wing route. And then if it got hit again, it basically turned the fuselage into a blowtorch. It's a horrible... When when you start reading about Varsity, the stories of it are terrible. Um, Frank Johnson, Canadian pilot who flew Typhoons, in his logbook for the Varsity mission, it's just flamers. You know, he, um, I have to look it up exactly, but he just says troop transport's on fire, parachute's on fire. Yeah. That's the, you know, and he was flying flak suppression, so he was doing some pretty dangerous stuff, but his memory of that day when he got home to write up his logbook yeah, was, was just watching those was watching those four hours gone. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's mind blown as well. For only one group in nine troop carry command transitioned over to the C forty six um before the end of hostilities in World War Two. There was another group that did after after the war ended, but it was a three thirteenth troop carry group who'd flown missions over Sicily, Italy Normandy, Market Garden, you know, they'd done done it all, basically. Technically speaking, for the operation, they flew 72 aircraft. 73 aircraft were involved, and but the, the, the 73rd, again, emphasises the difficulties with the aircraft because it is a humongous aircraft. If you ever had the chance to stand next to one or underneath one or whatever, it's a huge aircraft, and it's got a but massive... If, you, if you've ever watched Ice Pilots... Oh, one. absolutely, yeah, yeah. 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 They, they, they fly them regularly, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's got a humongous vertical stabiliser that acts as a, as a giant sail. So when the 313th were taken off from their airfield at Achille Le Grand in France for varsity, one of the aircraft takes a massive gust of crosswind and the pilot cannot bring the aircraft back under control. So this aircraft crashes into a load of parked vehicles and one of the undercarriages collapses and it ploughs through a load of tents, and 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 thankfully it doesn't kill anybody, but it it writes the aircraft off, and and this is before anything has happened really. It's the start of the operation. Um, so that that aircraft, the, all of the paratroopers of the of the five hundred thirteenth parachute infantry regiment have to jump off that aircraft like little lemmings and jump onto another one, and um and hope that the same thing doesn't happen again, and thankfully it doesn't. 
So 72 aircraft end up flying the operation. And of the 72 that flew the operation, 19 of them are shot down, which is mind-blowing. Losing nearly a quarter of of the aircraft on... Well, it is... It's more than a quarter, isn't it? It's 23%. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, yeah, it's mind-blowing. No, 28%. So I'm doing my math. Yeah, it, it's, it's mad. Again, we're going to go into a lot more detail, but especially about how they set it up because it's un- unlike normally where there's a bit of a gap between the 101st and the 82nd. This is everybody in one big, yeah, essentially stream of paratroopers being dropped in a very short. It's a fascinating operation, one with some incredible tales um, and some terrifying ones of, of fiery um, airplanes. And you'll have to wait, dear listener, for when Adam and I can plan that one out because there are so many moving parts in Varsity that I think we, we can't wing it as much as we've done tonight. <laughs> yeah. The short notice I gave Adam for this this pod. What's the books called, mate? As volume one's been out for a while, I have it in the post, which is going to be great, along with your book on the 82nd. So give, 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 us, give us a plug for both of them. Okay, so as I, as I mentioned at the start, Nine Troop Carrier Command get, consisted of three wings. So when me and Hans started working on a, a pictorial history of Nine Troop Carrier Command, we decided that we would break each volume down to, to focus on one of the wings. We started with the 52nd Troop Carrier Wing, and being brutally honest with you, there's one reason for one of the main reasons for that is because the 52nd Wing dropped, traditionally dropped the 82nd Airborne Division into combat. So I already knew quite, you know, I was already quite well versed on the 52nd wing and it felt like we could slide into that one quite nicely. The other reason was because I live in the East Midlands and the groups of the 52nd Troop Carrier Wing were based in uh, Lincolnshire. There was one in Rutland and there was one in North Northamptonshire. So they're all fairly close to me. The volume that's coming up is on the 53rd Troop Carrier Wing who um, were more tied into deploying the 101st Airborne Division um, into combat, although they did fly the gliders that carried the 82nd into combat for Normandy. So essentially what, what the volumes are is is the reason that they're as big as they are is because they're a pictorial history. We've been so incredibly lucky to get hold of some amazing photo collections. I mean, Boney knows what some of the collections include because whenever an obscure British aircraft or whatever comes up, I'll send it to Boney and I'll send it to, to Matt Willis and we'll, uh, we'll have a good look at it and, um, and yeah, take some um, enjoyment out of trying to work out whose aircraft it is and why it's there and all sorts of things like that. The, the, the photos that Adam has been sharing are just absolutely amazing. There's some really, really cool, weird stuff. Yeah. It, I, I mean, some some of them you look at and you go, why is that on a troop carrier airfield? But then, you know, um, I'm glad that they were. But um, essentially what the books cover is the history of Nine Troop Carrier Command from from operations it launched from England. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the volumes won't pay a huge amount of focus on operations like Dragoon, because obviously even though the, air, the, 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 the aircraft did fly from England to Italy to do it, the operation was launched from Italy. And the same with 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 Varsity, the lion's share of the operate of the groups that flew Varsity flew from France. So Varsity does get covered, but not in 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 huge detail. It it more focuses on the the operations carried out from England for Normandy and Market Garden and 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 Repulse and all the areas in between. And we try to give as much um, insight into what life on these airfields was like for for these guys and what life in the UK was like for them. And there's lots of photos of them on furlough around London and Nottingham and Lincoln sh- and yeah, you, you know, all the stuff the Americans did. And the, the other one, which I'm actually probably looking forward to more is your suddenly they were gone, which is all about the 82nd in Nottinghamshire and Lincolnshire, which it, it, I guess you can call it more of a, a, a social history of the, the impact of the 82nd showing up incognito, wasn't it? And then, um, the effect yeah. they had in, here in the UK. Yeah, basically, it's just. I, I mean, I I was born in Derby, but I was from 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 the age of eight. I was raised in Le- in Leicestershire, and so some of the units of the eighty second were camped prior to uh, Neptune, prior to D Day, and prior to Operation Market Garden in some of the villages that are fifteen twenty minutes from where I live. So um, ever since I was sixteen, started collecting 
testimonies of veterans about their time in the UK, started speaking to locals who remember the Americans in, in the area and uh, essentially just decided to do the opposite of what everyone else does, which is focus on the division's time in combat and focus on the time that they spent in, in England. Because invariably what I've, what I've found talking to a lot of veterans is that understandably some were very um, uh, reluctant to talk about their time in combat, but all of them were, were more than happy to talk about their time um, in England. So um, there's a lot of fun stories in there, a lot of funny stories in there. There's some not so funny stuff in there, but it's... Um, it, it, yeah, it was an interesting thing to work on. So as an 82nd guy, why have you got 101st reproduction? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have got I have got lots of 82nd stuff on this side of the room. I, I, I keep getting distracted by the jump knife. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, where, where, can you see that? I, yeah. I can't. I can only see part of my what, I'm, what my screen is. Yeah, um, I've got jump knives up there. I've got a V42 stiletto up there, which Ooh. was the... The American version of the um, the commando knife, I can't remember what commando knife, Fairbairn yeah. Sykes knife. I've got a machete up there. Yeah, I've got various bits and bobs. Most of my eighty second stuff is on on that side of the wall. That's just up there. And I've also got the that's modern day one hundred and first uh, subdued patches in that frame there um, with a flag that was flown over Afghanistan in a, in an Apache, yeah. uh, as you do. Um, yeah. So. But that, we, 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 that's a bit off topic. Yes, yeah, so that, is, that, is, that is a bit. Right, Adam, this has been fantastic. We're gonna. It, it's been too long. This this pod has been going for a year now. We've had Willis on twice. That's not fair. And it's taken me too long to get to get you on. So it's thank no you problem. so much be, for, be, for jumping on. Before we go, can I just because I wrote because I wrote them down? Can I really quickly just read a couple of stats out to you? Oh yes, pure, you, you found pure, the stats. Do it purely because they are absolutely mind blowing. Go for right. it. Go for it. So. In 1944, so we're talking one year of the war, nine troop carrier command airlifted 121,000 US tons of supplies, which I was amazed to learn is 242 million pounds of supplies to the Goodness. to the front lines. It, it gets it gets better. Sorry, two two hundred two hundred and forty two million pounds of supplies. Two hundred and forty two million. So that's two hundred forty two. That's a hundred million kilos. If that's what you two, think it is, two, yeah, two point two, two, two pounds. Yeah, so about about yeah. hundred million. Flip it, heck. Yeah, they also carried six point one million gallons of gasoline um in the year of 1944 to the front lines and i this was i was very impressed with working this one out that's <laughs> enough it's enough fuel to power it power the average family car in the uk for 35,000 years <laughs> which is incredible and it just makes you think how much gasoline did the allies get through in world war 2 well, fact, granted, they, if, they weren't the most fuel efficient. Yeah, no, <laughs> they didn't no. have the stop-start thing that we've we've got in, in our country. No, so here's it, it, here's the final one. Okay. They carried fifty million pounds of ammunition to the front lines in World War Two, right? And it equates to if uh, obviously they carried all sorts of mm. different ammunition during World War Two, but it equates to two billion rounds of M1 ammunition. Whoa. It's crazy numbers. Crazy numbers when you think about it. But, um, yeah, I thought I, it would be worth ringing off those numbers before we uh, we called it a day. No, that's a perfect way to wrap it up. Mate, thank you so much for joining us. We'll we'll get that varsity thing in the diary. But thank Absolutely, you so much. Yeah. And, and thanks so for letting me bore you on a Thursday evening. No, it's no problem. Anytime. I honestly think Adam is a bit of a rock star. And I'm not just saying that because he's a mate and the last of our AV Geeks group chat to come on to the new show, which is not acceptable. But that's why he is the 50th episode of this podcast. So thank you so much, Adam, for being my 50th episode. Thank you all for sticking with us for 50 episodes of me and various wonderful people waffling on about airplanes.
Now, like I said in the pod, I'm finally getting my hard copies of Adam's books. They're arriving soon. They haven't arrived yet, so I can't wave them around if you're watching the video version, which is handy because they weigh a ton. They're probably going to put my back out. But they're coming. They're available from Overlord Publishing, and the link for that is in the descriptions below. We're going to be doing some things around the launch of his new book next year, plus more C47 stuff. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Also, I just say follow Adam because he puts up some of these incredible images that he finds on his various Twitter feeds and Blue Sky, all of that. Like I said, give him a follow. He's great. He's also one of my co-hosts on the In Hiatus Boundary of Disaster podcast, which we do with Matt Willis and my daughter, Ellie. So that's going to be coming back. We're going to be talking motor racing, but not Formula One, because that's why it's on hiatus, because, yeah, we're all jaded. But on the Damcasters, we're going to keep going with aircraft. And next week, we have a fantastic guest in the form of aerobatic pilot Melanie Assels, who's my fellow Pima Air and Space Museum sponsoree. So that was a lot of fun to record. That's up next week. I have to thank Pima for their continued support of the pod. They're going to be continuing with us for a while, which is great. So many thanks to Scott and the team out in Tucson. And of course, thank you for your support. Liking, subscribing, putting stars into your podcast app of choice really does help. The algorithms do listen to these things. So thank you for that. The reviews that you've been putting up have been really nice. I'm loving the conversation as well. We're going to have to do some things so that we can do more chatting and maybe expand that AV Geeks group chat. Watch this space. Discord. Who knows? We will get cracking on it. So thank you ever so much for your continued support. If you want to get all this stuff early, you can become a damn castier for £3 a month plus a bit of that at the bottom tiers over on Patreon. Links in the description below. And of course, you get stickers and bookmarks and things which is just my way of saying thanks so much for your support because it really does mean a lot. It helps us keep ticking over. Until next time, when we return with Melanie to talk about extras, Red Bull air races, world championships, do take care of yourselves and thanks for listening. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bowe and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.